The bills are designed to protect homeowners caught up in the mortgage and foreclosure crisis. Joining me to explain what the proposed legislation would do is Dr. Michael Lee, director of SDSU's Corky McMillan Center for Real Estate. Dr. Lee, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Let's begin with some of the key points in these bills, because I, I read some of the bullet points, and, and I'll be upfront with you. Some of them seemed like obvious things that you would think were in place things regarding signatures and notice, but they're not, are they? Well, they're not because a lot of that had to do with what servicer practices have been, and servicer practices have been both all over the map. They're not in a standardized way, but secondly, servicers have been working on kind of an understaffed pressure situation that has led them to cut a lot of corners. So, so what will this bill do? What would, would these bills do? Well, one of the major objectives of these bills is to provide more of a certain standardized, transparent process. And you know, it has requirements for the lenders to you know, basically go through an offer and evaluate modification uh, alternatives before uh, instituting a foreclosure process. And it really requires or puts the onus on them to, you know, have this done right, uh, avoid some of the kind of outsourcing problems that plagued earlier um, processes. So this is really about regulating the foreclosure process by government as opposed to just sort of it being self-regulated as it has been in the past. Now one of the things this these laws seem to look at is something called dual track foreclosures. Now we hear a lot of stories out there about people who say well the only way the bank would renegotiate my loan is if I was behind on my mortgage payment so I decided to stop paying. Is this what dual track foreclosures is trying to address? Uh, dual track foreclosures relates to uh, or to the fact that banks were both uh, engaging in modification discussions and evaluations with borrowers and pursuing a foreclosure action at the same time. And in some cases, the foreclosure action gets ahead of the loan modification discussion and all of a sudden the uh, homeowner finds uh, that their house is up for sale and they say, but I've been talking to the bank about modification. Part of that is that two parts of the bank are different parts are doing this and they're not necessarily talking to each other. So at least this would put a more formal process. But I will want to correct one thing is that the government isn't specifically regulating this. This is still up to the banks to come up with uh, these practices that meet these guidelines. And the regulation, if you will, is the threat of potential legal action um, that could uh, overturn a foreclosure. Oh, okay, so l let's pick up on that a little bit. So the, if, this, if these bills become law, this doesn't say, it's not the law of the land for banks, it just says you must follow these regulations or else... Or else uh, there is a task force that's being set up that could pursue legal action against the bank. There are civil penalties that the bank may have. There are also provisions <coughs> within this in which the borrower can go to court and uh, challenge uh, an action, and this gives them more of a standing in the court. So the bottom line, if, if these become law, what happens to our housing market in San Diego County? Does it get better? Marginally, but this is not going to have a big effect on the, uh, the housing market. And one reason is that uh, the magnitude of the settlement, even though California got uh, the lion's share of that, is still small relative to the total magnitude of the problem. You're talking about the past settlement uh, a couple of weeks ago. A couple in the of news, weeks yes. ago. And a lot of what the Homeowners Bill of Rights is, is codifying the uh, agreements that were put into the settlement. And remember, the settlement only covered five banks. Mm -hmm. And so this is being uh, a more widespread, uh, this is going to apply to all banks. Finally, we don't have a lot of time left, but how are the banks reacting to this? Well, I haven't seen specific uh, uh, comments from them, but I think that the reason, one reason that the banks entered into this agreement is to kind of redu remove some uncertainty about future litigation that can come from state, federal, or, or private sources. And the, the settlement goes part way, but not certainly all the way in there. If it did provide that certainty, that would be good for the banks because then that might get them to do more lending. 
The problem is that there's still a lot of uncertainties here, and the provisions of the settlement add significant costs uh, and some potential risks to the banks. And so one negative of this may be that uh, we don't really open up the, uh, the lending spigot uh, significantly, and I think that's been something holding back the housing market. Okay, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Joanne.